Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this virtual talk uh, on Kubernetes Cloud Provider IBM Project Overview and Deep Dive. My name is Sadeh Zala. I am a senior software engineer at IBM and a co-lead for this project. Uh, Richard, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Richard Tice. I'm a senior software engineer, and I'm the OpenShift and Kubernetes release lead for our managed services for OpenShift and Kubernetes. Okay, uh, Brad, would you like to introduce quickly? Sure, Sadov. Hi, everyone. I'm Brad Topol. I'm IBM's Distinguished Engineer for Open Technologies and Developer Advocacy. Um, all right, thank you, Brad. Um, all right, so uh, I will provide an overview and you know the activities uh, structure of the project, and then we will uh, you know straight deep dive into. Uh, the three uh, repositories, the main repos we have, uh, actually it's four repositories, uh, but the three main repositories for uh, cluster API provider IBM Cloud, uh, there is one for VPC block storage, and then uh, we have two under IBM Cloud provider. All right, so uh, let me just brief about uh, the broader spatial interest group cloud provider. Uh, this SIG cloud provider is a, it's a group of people interested in various aspects of running Kubernetes on different uh, cloud provider clouds. Um, it owns cloud provider, provider interface code, which is responsible for running uh, all the cloud provider specific control loops, right? Uh, you can uh, read more about uh, the code uh, uh, on the link I have provided. Uh, the SIG also ens uh, ensures that the Kubernetes ecosystem evolve in a way that is neutral to various cloud providers. And the same time it ensures that uh, it provides consistent and high quality experience to the users. Uh, the SIG owns uh, different sub projects. They were formerly uh, had their own uh, uh, you know, a, a specific uh, uh, SIG. Uh, but now they're part of the SIG Cloud Provider and uh, the provider IBM Cloud is uh, one of the sub project. Uh, you can read more about the SIG Cloud Provider uh, on the link I have provided at the bottom of this slide. All right, so the provider IBM Cloud sub project, it's, uh, it's all about uh, you know, development and discussions around uh, various aspect of running Kubernetes on IBM Cloud. Uh, we also participate in you know, various uh, activities uh, uh, happening in the SIG Cloud Provider. And you know, uh, as a member of this uh, project, uh, or you're just following it, you basically are you know, staying on top of uh, what's going on in the IBM Cloud platform with respect to Kubernetes and related uh, CNCF projects. Uh, we strictly don't discuss any commercial uh, kind of, uh, you know, activities or any discussions related to it. Uh, it's all about, uh, you know, open source side of Kubernetes and, uh, you know, related development. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have a total of four code repositories under the project. Uh, this year has been great uh, for the project. We uh, added uh, three, new three new repositories, the bottom three, and we will, uh, you know, uh, do a briefing on each of them. Uh, but before that, real quick, uh, just about the structure of the project, how it works. So we have three colleagues uh, from different areas uh, of IBM Cloud. We have Khalid Ahmed, who is an IBM distinguished engineer from Multi-Cloud Manager, uh, Richard Thais from the IKS and Rock side, and uh, myself, Sadev, uh, from the open source software side, if you haven't already joined the mailing list, we would love you to join it. Uh, but we also have a Slack channel uh, where you can, you can post questions or if you want to have any discussions, please ping there. We meet every month, every last Wednesday at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, but if, if you, 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 know, you miss the past meetings, you cannot attend it, then you can always look at the meeting recordings, which is available on uh, Kubernetes uh, YouTube channel. And again, in the link, you can read more about the project. All right, so I uh, mentioned uh, that we added uh, you know, uh, three new repositories, but this one, the Cluster API Provider IBM Cloud has been around for some time now. 
Um, as you already uh, know, uh, there is a cluster API uh, project uh, within the Kubernetes project, right? Uh, it's basically about uh, the about managing the cluster lifecycle, uh, creating, scaling, upgrading, and you know, destroying the cluster uh, by uh, Kubernetes style declarative APIs. Um, so it's basically Kubernetes uh, to manage Kubernetes, right? So there is a management Kubernetes cluster which manages the workload cluster where uh, the applications are running. And similar to Kube uh, CTL that we use for uh, working with the Kubernetes, uh, there is a command line uh, tool uh, called cluster CTL uh, for creating and managing uh, provider clusters. Again, the, uh, there is a link uh, to read uh, more about uh, cluster API. Uh, there is a whole book out there actually. Uh, so various cloud provider, they extend the cluster API and for IBM Cloud, we are extending it under cluster API provider IBM Cloud. Um, it abstracts the infrastructure specific details. Uh, and uh, as I said, you know, this, this repository has been around for some time. Uh, we already had the support for classic infrastructure, but uh, this year we added support for IBM VPC Gen 2 and Power VS. Uh, we are also working on uh, a new release for this added support. Uh, again, the link is there. We would like you to, you know, take a look, uh, lots of good documentations, and we would love to have you contribute there. These, this repo, the IBM VPC block CSA driver uh, was, uh, was, was uh, moved to the Kubernetes 6 just recently. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, just, just in a couple of months. Um, so it provides a CSI plugin for creating and mounting VPC block storage uh, for your applications running on Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster on IBM VPC infrastructure. Uh, it currently supports Kubernetes uh, version 1.21, 1.20, 1.19, and for OpenShift, it supports 4.7 and 4.6. Uh, we would love to, you know, take a look at uh, the the repo, the documentation. Uh, we really have good doc out there on how to deploy uh, the plugin. Uh, we use it in production ourselves, uh, so you know. Uh, Take a look, let us know if you have any questions and you know, uh, contribute uh, if you can. Uh, with that, uh, I will hand it over to Richard for IKS. Awesome, thank you. So yeah, I'll, I'll be covering IKS and rocks and um, providing details on our cloud controller manager, our cloud provider project. So we'll start with IKS, just to give you a little background um, on our Kubernetes service, it is our our managed offering for deploying Kubernetes clusters on IBM Cloud. And our Cloud Controller Manager, our IBM Cloud Provider, um, is used as part of this service. So this service is certified Kubernetes Conformant, which is a, a really nice program from the CNCF to certify offerings as Kubernetes uh, compliant um, and so that customers can you know, build their apps on cloud native, a certified platform for deploying uh, those container apps on Kubernetes, regardless of cloud provider. If you want more details on our service from IBM, you can check out that link. All right, let's jump to the next slide and we'll talk about releases. So really, I, I always put this slide on a conversation here to talk about our releases and really to focus on how they're related to the community and Kubernetes releases and how they work. Um, so IKS has provided two releases of Kubernetes this year three last year, and we're on target to deliver another release uh, very soon. So that'll bring us to three releases in 2021. And even with the move from the community from four releases a year down to three, which is certainly helpful for many consumers, it's still um, very challenging for many to keep pace with the uh, Kubernetes. Um, this is a, a current uh, view of our support structure from IKS. Um, we support 119 and later fully. Um, 122 is uh, coming out soon, um, and our 118 release is now deprecated, um, and we'll be out of support very soon. So this is very similar structure to the Kubernetes community, which just came out with patch releases 119 to 122 this week. 
So they have four releases in support at the moment, but 119 will be dropping out of support soon. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. And we'll talk ROX. So ROX is the OpenShift managed service on IBM Cloud. Um, and OpenShift builds on Kubernetes and it um, is also certified Kubernetes conformant. So OpenShift provides some additional features, which Brad will talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, and if you want more information on the managed service, feel free to check out that link on the slide. And then we'll jump to the next slide to talk about the releases here for OpenShift. So OpenShift, building on Kubernetes, we lay out here uh, from our docs, the uh, OpenShift versus Kubernetes version. Um, so each version of OpenShift has, is associated with a certain version of Kubernetes. Um, and we support um, three um, versions at the moment, fully supported. Um, this year, we've released two. We're going for a third OpenShift version 4.8 here shortly. And that, again, will bring us uh, to three releases in 2021, just like we had in 2020. In the, um, um, just like our, our, our uh, Kubernetes users, uh, OpenShift users often find themselves in a different or a difficult position at times to keep pace. Uh, one of the benefits of OpenShift in this space is that uh, Red Hat, as a provider of OpenShift um, takes on additional extended support uh, of certain releases. So you'll see on the slide that we talk about, we have OpenShift support for um, 3.11 at the moment, and it's quite extended. And we'll have some extended support here as well for 4.6. So, but otherwise it's, it's for the most part aligned on the Kubernetes support timelines, uh, slightly shifted for OpenShift. All right, we'll jump to the next slide. So on both of these uh, managed services, and then many managed services across uh, cloud providers, they um, implement what um, the community calls the cloud controller manager, which is the control loop within Kubernetes um, owned by the, um, the cloud provider SIG, which is the interface for this control loop to manage um, an interface with the cloud to deliver certain features to the Kubernetes cluster that Kubernetes itself doesn't implement because um, they're cloud provider specific and that the cloud controller manager is then responsible for implementing those key features um, for the cloud. Now this view here shows the CCM architecture, which is the new architecture out of tree cloud providers. Um, the cloud controller manager runs in the control plane alongside the API server scheduler at CD, and the Kubernetes controller manager. And then the worker side of things You've got your kubelet, kube proxy, other network proxy, uh, uh, CNI setup, container runtime, and so on, out on the, the worker nodes. So that's the basic structure that it is today um, for the new cloud providers. So we'll move to the next slide and we'll talk about a little bit more details on what a cloud provider um, um, provides in Kubernetes. So for most cloud providers, there's two main things. Number one is load balancers. And number two is instances. We'll start with load balancers. Um, for IBM Cloud, we provide four different flavors of load balancers. Um, and it depends on the infrastructure on which you run. So if you're on our classic infrastructure, you get the first two network load balancers and they run in cluster. Um, they leverage um, basic in cluster networking, IP tables, IPVS are, are the two different versions there. And then if you move to our VPC infrastructure, VPC Gen 2, um, we have a couple uh, load balancers there as well, different flavors. And they're configured um, um, slightly differently. Uh, details are in our docs as far as how that is concerned. Um, we also, with our open source project for the cloud provider, we you can certainly dig into the code details to find out how that's all done with the, the docs associated with that at the cloud provider level and how those load balancer types are configured. And then the next major part of a cloud provider is it's, it's responsible for node initialization. And this is extremely important. So I'm talking like Kubernetes nodes um, getting brought up and um, um, brought into the cluster. They get stored in the etcd database. The node is coming online, but the node stays tainted until the cloud provider comes in and clears the taint for the node so that it is initialized by the cloud provider. So it's a really important part of the bootstrap process for your cluster, that the cloud provider is functional. It's able to understand that net node comes, coming in, get some data about the node so that it can provide it to Kubernetes. 
you know, some of the key data that it needs to know is the type of instances you're dealing with, you know, you know what, what, what zone is it in and so on, so that those can be used to bootstrap the uh, node into Kubernetes cluster. Right now in our managed service offerings, we rely on an internal bootstrapping process to help us with this. Um, we are working on enhancing this to support OpenShift IPI UPI installs, which would be done outside of the managed service environment. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we have a couple of other big interfaces, clusters and routes. We don't implement them at the moment. We rely on a CNI or um, you know, like Calico, or in the case of OpenShift, like I think it's OBS or OVN to do the routing and configuration. But we are looking at possibly um, having some route support for VPC native routing. Um, and some cloud providers do that as well. And there's other things that cloud providers can plug in to these um, and extend upon. Storage being um, one of the things you may find in some cloud providers or like credential operators. Um, but uh, Saad, I've already talked about how we have the VPC block um, plug in there, which is a separate repository, separate uh, control loop. So we'll move on to the next slide. And we'll look at some of the activities that that we're focused on at the moment. So one of the big things this year is to deliver the open source version of our cloud provider. So we have two repos out there. One builds the core, um, the other ones used for VPC, um, uh, some of the VPC component. Um, there's a bit of a history as why it's done that way. Ultimately, we like to have just one repo, but that's out there available to build. Um, check out the code. It's based on Kubernetes 1.22. Okay. And this is one of the main drivers to deliver the open source um, was to support OpenShift IPI or UPI installs on IBM Cloud. So this is an installation done outside of the managed service. Now OpenShift provides um, this type of installation on a lot of cloud providers. Okay, So one of the key things that happened though for OpenShift and Red Hat in the Fort 9 timeframe is that all the cloud providers um, from the early days in Kubernetes, they were built in tree. Okay, so like Google's cloud provider and Amazon, and AWS, you know, and Azure, and so on. They were in tree. Now the uh, cloud provider community and the SIG has determined that those are all deprecated, all those cloud providers in tree. They need to move out of tree, and that is going to be the new path forward. And eventually, those in tree cloud providers will be removed from the code base in Kubernetes. Okay, so it's really important for consumers to switch to out of tree cloud providers. And the 4.9 release of OpenShift is really where the Red Hat folks worked with a lot of the cloud providers to start transitioning from these in-tree providers to out of tree. So they did a lot of work with like uh, OpenStack folks and um, Amazon and Microsoft and obviously us, IBM, to try to support um, CCM-based installs of OpenShift on various cloud providers. So we started our work in 4.9. Continuing here in 4.10 of OpenShift, our goal is to complete in 4.10. And, and that is a lot of changes will be required for our cloud provider to um, support this type of installation mechanism. Because at the moment, it was designed for our managed services. So that's another second big piece that we're working on. With that, you know, different features will hopefully be coming in the areas of networking. Um, we've been looking at different things in the load balancers or in uh, routing. And then having this up in OpenShift in the community, also having the open source up there, we hope to extend that support, build it on our community, provided more documentation, how to deploy it on your own, how to do all those things um, so that um, you know we can grow this community. And that pretty much covers the cloud provider overview. So I'll jump to the next slide and turn it over to uh, Brad. Thank you. Um, so one question that we typically get at this session is what's the difference between Kubernetes and OpenShift? And essentially OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribution that includes extra tooling to simplify cloud native development and provide automated operation support. So for example, in just vanilla Kubernetes, if you want to uh, deploy your application, what do you need to do? You typically start uh, you, you find a base image and you use uh, Docker commands to, to then take the base image and then add your code to that image. And you'll, uh, you'll create a new image using those commands and then you'll push it to a registry. 
And so a lot of us, you know, um, the folks on, the, on, on this uh, presentation, we're very familiar with doing those steps. We're very comfortable doing it. But there's a lot of developers out there like Java developers that aren't very familiar with those steps. And so what OpenShift provides you is it provides you the ability to, it'll, it'll recognize your source code repository and pick the right base image for you and it'll automatically take your code, merge it with the base image, create the new image, and push that image to one of its registries. So it's, it's reducing the friction for developers who wouldn't commonly know those low-level uh, cloud-native development steps of dealing with the containers and, and uh, dealing with the image and, and building the container image. Um, so... Uh, you know, OpenShift's going to take care of that with its sourced image and make that a lot easier for, for those types of developers. It also pro provides nice techniques for recognizing when images change or when the configurations change and even being able to automate, automate actually the deploy uh, when those changes occur. So that management aspect is also made simpler through OpenShift. Um, OpenShift's security is, is a big big feature of, of, of it. It has good security guardrails. So with vanilla Kubernetes, you can do a lot of things that'll let you out of the box, do a lot of things that aren't very secure. It really will let you uh, run around with scissors in your hand. And uh, with OpenShift, they're gonna have guardrails to keep that from happening. So for example, um, OpenShift will prevent privileged containers from running by default. Um, if you ever take a container and let it run as privileged, it gives it root access. There is a lot of surface area for a security breach when you do that. So out of the box, OpenShift is gonna keep you from doing that. And you'd be surprised how many images are out there that you didn't realize are, are built to run as privileged. Um, similarly, OpenShift gives you, um, it, it prevents you from running with a default namespace. Again, using the default namespace is not as secure and you really need to learn to not use it. And so OpenShift keeps you from doing that. And a final security feature that I wanna cover is the notion of security context constraints. Basically, OpenShift provides you several security profiles that you can choose for your pods container. And what's nice about that is that, that enables you to not have to worry about all the individual security knobs and try and get all the individual security settings correct. Because if you have like 25 settings, the odds are you're trying to uh, set each one individually and you think you know what you're doing, the odds are you may not. And so instead of you setting all the individual knobs, you can just pick a security context profile and use the one that's, that's best for your, uh, for your pods container. And the nice thing is then you know what features, what security uh, enablement your pods container is gonna get when you pick that security context. So you'll know, will I have root access or not? Will I have access to all the block storage or only a portion of it? Will I have to run as user? So all those types of features and you'll know exactly what you're guaranteed to get. Um, security context constraints give you that ability. Um, day two operations. This is another place where OpenShift really shines. Uh, it has automated cluster size management, so it can automatically provision new worker nodes to increase your, increase your cluster size. That's a huge feature that you don't get with vanilla Kubernetes. Um, automated day two operations. It can do automated installation, automated updates. Um, it worries about making sure the right version of OpenShift is running on the right version of RHEL so that uh, you're guaranteed you've got full stack consistency. It uses a capability of identifying what are called cluster versions. And so it does cluster version management um, to do all that automation of, of the lifecycle management. So th those are huge features for your day two and your, your IT operations side of your house. And of course, OpenShift also provides multi-cloud management support, provides a unified cloud console to view and manage multiple OpenShift clusters. So as you get into production and you're dealing with multiple clusters on multiple clouds, um, this is where OpenShift is gonna shine as well. Uh, next chart. So um, we'd like to thank you for coming to this presentation. We hope it's been very helpful. Uh, please, please feel free to reach out to us. 
Um, and uh, we will be available during the virtual playback for questions, or you can reach out to us on Twitter or our other contact mechanisms. Um, and again, thank you for coming to our presentation.